80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro-black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pie rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click when, when did you first get the high desert what year was it well i got the high desert in uh 2010 it was about may of 2010 and if you can remember how long do you believe you was there before you saw a violent incident that made you realize okay uh it's serious up here and 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 also if you can recall what was that incident well, the first is that I seen was uh, well, honestly, when I got to Oranor, so as soon as you get to Oranor and Hard Desert, it says High Drama State Prison. So when I get in there, they stripping us out, asshole naked. So you got a, a a black, but he runs as a southerner. So he says something slick to the police. So the police ends up whooping his ass, sprays him, throws him in a cage, and then puts a fan on him and leaves him there for hours for ass while he's asshole naked. So that was the first thing that said, okay, this 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 place is different. And then once I got to the yard, uh, I think it was my first yard, the first yard we out there. Uh, the white boy ended up stabbing another white boy. So he probably stabbed the dude at least like 50 times. So in the midst of him stabbing him, the tower shoots him with a mini 14. Hmm. Do you know if 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 the guy who was doing the stabbing, do you know if he lost his life? Well, I don't I don't know if he lived or if he died. I, I do not know. And so another thing that I've heard about High Desert is that prison is notorious for having corrupt guards and guards who favor um the white convicts up there. Um because you just described the incident where they they jumped on a a black dude who who ran with the southerners and then they sprayed him and then they put him in a in a cage and turned the fan on and the reason they turned the fan on is because the irritation of the of the pepper spray is definitely going to be worse with the fan on you know and so that was a cold situation so in your in your experience is it notorious up there with the guards as, as i have heard man how it does it is like the, the, the breeding ground for the ku klux klan of the co's you know they walk around uh they make it be known that they don't like black people they make it known off the top like when Barack Obama was president, oh, they say, oh, man, that's the worst president we ever had. We hate that president. He's trying to take away our fucking guns and things of that nature. So they let it be known that they do not like black people at all. Right. And I've actually heard another CEO who uh, who has some experience or I believe some of his friends had some experience either at High Desert or or Pelican Bay. He has a channel called that prison guard. He pretty much said the same thing. And so when you out there on the yard. And I'm assuming you're either 18 or 19 when you're seeing this white dude get 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 stabbed, and then you see the the guard shoot him. What does that What does that do to your psyche, man? What does that make you? You know, when you seeing that, when you seeing that, you know, that incident. What does that make you think? Like, man, the first time you see, you like, damn, man, this, this this shit is real. This is a whole different ball game. Like, man, you know, you hear about the things that go on in prison, but when you actually see it, it's like, damn, like, man, I gotta. I got to be on my P's and Q's at all times because uh, the slightest, smallest little thing can cost you your life. And when you're seeing things like that, it's like, OK, the correctional officers, they're not going to save you. So you got to be your own line of defense. So now that's like, man, I got I, I got to be aware and be on a whole nother whole nother type of ball game. I think I was at High Desert for about three months before I did uh, did my first removal. And so um, when he when he says he did his first removal. Basically, what he's talking about is, I guess, somebody had ran across some trouble where his collective felt he was no longer 
the individual who they had to remove was no longer wanted on the yard. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about it in prison as a DP. And so can you can you explain to us as much as you want to or as much as you feel is, you know, it's comfortable? Why was that dude removed and, and what happened? Well, basically, uh, he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. And then he disrespected uh, one of the, one of the fellas. And once he disrespected one of the fellas in front of another a whole another entity, you know we couldn't accept that. Oh, okay. So basically, he he did something. He 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 was in violation, and then also he got verbally disrespectful with somebody else in front of another race. Exactly, exactly. And so was this was this individual. Obviously, he was from your collective and, and, and from your clique or from your area. Was he was he an individual who you had a pretty close relationship with and you spoke to often or was he just somebody in your collective? No, nah, he really had a relationship with Marcelli. But to me, you know, uh, I used to say hi and bye to him. We wasn't too close or nothing like that. Right. And so um, people often wonder with with black convicts, you know, were you. Um, assigned to get on his helmet? Did you volunteer to get on his helmet? How did it happen that you became involved? No, it's like I told you, man, I was fresh from CYA, so in my mind, I, I, I said, you know, the first time I get a chance, I'm going. So right. automatically, I volunteered myself, because the dude he disrespected, <laughs> he act like he didn't even care, but I took it upon myself. Right. And so did... um. Was it just you, uh, solo that hopped on him with the lefts and the rights, or did you did you bust on him, or was it was it a, a crew of you guys that went? No, nah, no, nah, we we you know it was a, a, a fist removal. It was a couple of us, a couple of the fellas. And so, did you were you were you caught, or did you get away with it? No, nah, no, nah, we uh got sprayed. They shot the black gun, and then uh got cuffed up. They took him to medical. Uh, he had cuts and stuff on his faces and things of that nature. Right. And so for people out there wondering, you know, how can you just basically, you know, physically hop on somebody's head who you had a, at least a small relationship? Like, unfortunately, that's the life in prison. So you felt you had no you felt no qualms about, you know, busting him up. No, I, I didn't feel nothing about it at all. You know, it was like a, another day on the job, another day in prison life, because, you know, after even like people might say, oh, three months, that's not a, uh, that long in prison. But when you're in prison for three months, you see a lot of things, a lot of violence. So it's like, OK, this is this is the normal. This is what we're supposed to do. This is is, is regular. Right. And then, you of know, course, like you say, by that time, even though you had only been in prison for three months, you had lived that lifestyle for about four or five years. You had been through YA being introduced and seeing a lot of violence. So like you said, it was just normal. This was the type of thing we signed up for by joining the game. Um, being in high desert, did you ever experience any, any riots, whether it was black on black, white and Hispanic, Mexican and, uh, Mexican and black, um, uh, how long were you there before you seen your first riot? Yeah, uh, hard desert, I was in hard desert for five years. I say I was there probably about, uh, about six months. They let the Southerners and the, and the Northerners off lockdown and immediately they went at it. Immediately they went at it. And then after they went on lockdown, uh, the blacks had the yard. So then one day they was uh, the blacks was the brothers was on the basketball court, and the Keyways and the Bay Area's had a riot. And then they went on lockdown. Then they squashed that. And then the Bloods and the Keyways had had a couple of riots back to back. Hmm. And so by you being from SAC, what was your relationship, if any, uh, with the Northerners? The Northerners, uh, we had a, a cool relationship. You know, we were social, worked at, worked out in the same areas. And and so, by you being from Sacramento, for those who don't know, you guys don't function with the with the Bay Car, right? Um, the San Francisco Oakland Car, or did you guys function with them? No, no, we just push a uh, uh, Sacramento Car. Uh huh. And so. What what is what is it like like when you hit the yard for the first time and, and you see the northern Hispanics or excuse me the northern Mexicans and the southern Mexicans getting into it? So what do you do? You just get out the way, put your back on the wall, or 
man, you just, you just, you just get out the way, uh, make sure you buy a group of brothers and you sit there and you watch the show. And so during that time, um, being in high desert, how many people do you believe was stabbed up there while you was up there? Or how many people do you believe you saw stabbed? Well, my whole time in high desert, uh, man, I've seen countless people, countless. I'm talking about down there every yard. It's a yard. What you say? Your damn, your damn. Right. Every yard is a yard damn, your damn. Prone out, prone out. I remember one time, man, they did a dude so bad, man, they hit him about 80 times. It's snowing. They made the whole yard prone out and then stripped us out naked. And how long, how long did they leave you guys out there in the snow? Man, we was in the snow for at least three hours. With, with the zip ties on and stuff? Man, we had the zip ties on. Then once they took the zip ties off, we had to strip out. And they stripping out the yard in a control in the control manner. So they going group by group by group by group. Right. And so when you get back in the cell, you freeze and you, you couldn't wait to get back in that cell, huh? So when you get back to the cell, you like, man, this shit is something else. Your clothes is wet. Now you gotta wash all your your, your, your clothes in the sink. Then you got a bird bath. Now you got all this laundry hanging up. But you happy to be in a cell, but you like, man, that 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 was a, a whole different type of situation. Shit like that kind of like traumatized you. Like you'll never forget about moments like that. Most definitely, you know. And I remember when I first got to prison, you know, being young, being young minded, still um, holding on to many of my gang, but holding on to all of my gang beliefs. When you when you would hear when we would hear, okay, uh, such and such is about to get beat up, disciplined on the yard, stabbed or whatever. Oh, I'm right outside. I want a front row seat. I want to see all this. Then exactly. later, on, later on in my time, I hear such and such is getting ready to get beat up. Man, I'm in the cell because I don't want to experience, you know, sitting outside for three, four hours being handcuffed over something that I didn't have anything to do. You know, at, at some point, seeing all that stuff, you know, after you after you didn't see so many people beat up, stabbed and stuff, it's just like you say, it's just every day running a meal, and I got tired of just sitting on the ground, and I was just pr pretty much tired of that lifestyle. Did you ever reach a point like that? Well, nah, you know, you kind of like, like I say, it become routine, it become normal. But then again, though, uh, yeah, you know, after a while, it's like, man, this shit is old. Like, oh, they about to do what? Like, oh, man, I'm man, I'm about to go in and get me a shower. Man, I'm not trying to see that, because at, at the end of the day, you realize that it's senseless. Like, a lot of it is over nothing. Right. And then so you said you stayed at at high desert and then you was transferred to another level four. Um, and you've been incarcerated. What is that? 17 years. Yeah, I've been incarcerated 17 years in a couple months. Right. And so his whole entire stay, he's been on level fours. Um, so when you get to this other level four, what's life like there? So when I get to this other level four, uh, we're opening up the yard. The, the yard is transitioning from a level three to a level four, 270. So now they're bringing all the level four 180s to this level four, 270, which is the new yard that's being opened up. So the first thing I do when I get to the to the yard is I say, man, uh, what's going on with the politics? What's the politics like? So basically they tell me, oh, you know, we still got to figure it out. So the whole building is on orientation for about 30 days. So as soon as I get off orientation, I say about a month after that, uh, one of my enemies pull up. So I end up introducing myself to him. He said the wrong thing. I end up taking off on him. So when I take off on him, my celly jump in. So now we didn't we didn't drive him and knock him to the ground. So when he get up, we tear the white jumpsuit off of him. That's the new arrival jumpsuit. We tear the white jumpsuit off of him. So he jump up, he and his boxers, he run all the way across the yard to the police and prone out. So we chase him all the way across the yard. When we get there, the police is spreading us up. So we end up uh, being cuffed up and took to the cages and being stripped out. So after that, a couple days later, I'm coming back from work and some of his partners is trying to jump me. So while they trying to jump me and we sitting there going toe to toe, my other partner, he on the other side of the yard who jumped in my fight, he on the other side of the yard getting down with one of his homies. So after that incident, they take us all to the to the hole. Now they got a gang investigation going on trying to figure out 
whereas these problems occur back to back. So uh, I'm in a hole for about a month. I come out the hole. They send me to a building. I end up being in a, in a cell with an OG who had been down 36 years in, in prison at that time. So he said, oh, man, you know, you was a youngster out there the other day gang banging. He said, look, youngster, he said, man, let me give you some game. He said, look around you. He said, man, ain't nobody out here acting up like that. He said, man, what you need to do is you need to get a grill, take a couple of these self-help groups, man, and get your mind right. He said, man, you've been down since you was 14 years old. He said, best believe, youngster, you're going to go home. So, you know, I'm hearing him, but in my mind, I'm like, man, once these dudes go back, uh, get out the hole, it's back on and popping. I just can't let that happen. But fortunately, you know, uh, all praise be to Allah, he had another plan. So they never came back to the yard. They ended up getting transferred out to another prison. So this is when I started to have a transformation in my mind frame about uh, what I should be focused on. So I gather that that. When the when the dude hit the yard, who you said was from from somebody that your your um your area beats with, you know, because you have you'll have certain cars that sometimes when they go to prison, they'll put the street stuff to the street and they'll all push together. So um, you guys wasn't doing that as far as being from Sacramento. You guys were still isolated by certain cliques. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, we, we function in our own way. Right. And so earlier you said when you happened to be at the other prison in High Desert and you was in the cell with a, a OG from your area, what were some of the books he gave you to read? To read? And if you can cannot remember that, what were some of the books you said that you that you read that helped change your mind state? Well, two two profound books that uh that really changed my mind state was uh, a book by George Jackson called Soledad Brother, and you know he talks about being up against oppression. Uh, being in a struggle through the system, educating yourself, and not letting it break you. And then another profound book was uh, Tukey Williams, Blue Rage, Black Redemption, because he talked about how growing up, you know, he glorified this chaos that he had built. And then when he came back to prison, he had the Black Redemption, which he, you know, figured out that, you know, instead of destroying my people, I need to uplift my people. You know, I need to bring the community back together. I need to use my influence in a positive way so that, you know, future generations don't end up where I'm at, you know, on death row or, you know, in prisons with life sentences or life without parole. Because when they come in here, everything that they thought was true, they're going to notice that they was living the law. Whatever became of your older brother, who you said was from Parkway? Well, you know, he's been uh, in and out of jail. Uh, just got off parole. He's doing cool right now, trying to uh, maintain a, 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 a good life and do the right thing. And the reason why I asked is because earlier in a conversation that me and you had, you told me that um, you rap and you have you have actually some good you have some good music on YouTube. And I believe one of these songs was called uh, was Drill Estate. And the name of that song is Odds Against Me. And when I looked at the cover, it said brothers incarcerated. And so I was wondering if your brother was incarcerated at that time or whatever. And also the other name of the story that you have, the other name of the song is called Drilla Stay, D-R-I-L-L-A, Stay uh, Black Ops. If you guys get a chance, definitely go check that out. I'll probably try to insert some of that footage into the video. Um, so, uh, well, about the about the brothers incarcerated, right? Uh -huh. That's really the, the the cover is really a cover to that uh, my soundtrack to my documentary part three. I got a documentary coming out that's called Brothers Incarcerated, which is giving voice to those who are in prison to tell their stories and to show you a little bit about what goes on inside prison. And then you also mentioned to me that um, the struggle, the struggle, young black men. What uh, can you can you expound on that and tell everybody what that is? Oh, yes. I have uh, two documentaries. The first documentary is based on my life story. It's called Little State, The Struggle Young Black Men in America. So basically, it takes my life and puts it on a microcosm of, uh, of what's going on in America. You know, uh, what we go through growing up and then being in the system and how the system impacts us. And, you know, the lifestyles that we live is either jail or death because, you know, out of all my partners, a few of them are successful. But most of us that have played on the same football team is either in prison or we dead. So I'm showing people, you know, this is what we go through, you know, right. and also in my documentary, I'm showing you that, you know, I show footage of 
you know, how you got to wash your clothes in a cell or why you can't spit in the toilet or why you got to keep your mattress rolled up. I show footage of all these things. And, and then my and second what? documentary is uh, Little State Beautiful Elevation, which is, you know, a lot of my friends has been incarcerated who's now out and they're doing positive things with their life and trying to change the community. And so initially when you came to to prison with 50 years to life, did you have any did you have any hope of, of ever being freed? Well, no, I, 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 I really didn't. You know, it's like your worst fear coming true. You know, just just like, damn, this is where I got to spend the rest of my time at in this little box in a place that would be a person bathroom. So I never I never really thought like, OK, man, you know what, man, I'm going to get out. But over time, things started changing. And then, you know, OGs always told me, youngster, you're going to get out. Even when I first came to prison, youngster, you've been in jail since you was 14. Just, just know you're going to get out. And so and that was going to be my next question. I was going to ask you. Um, at what point, if any, did you start to have some hope um, in terms of that you may possibly be freed from prison as a lifer? Because uh, you came at a good time, 2010, maybe about two or three. Well, by that time, actually, many lifers was being paroled, but but especially in, in the next coming years. So what was that like to you hearing that people who had life were being released from prison? Well, I think it was about 2013, 2014 when they passed the. Uh... Senate Bill 260. And when they passed Senate Bill 260 for juvenile for uh, juvenile offenders, they sent me a, a parole change notice. And it went from uh, 2057 to like 2026. And that's when I had my first real glimmer of hope. Wow. And so let's 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 say that again, man. So initially, when you got to prison, your parole date was 2057. When I first got to prison, my, my release date was 2057. And so having a parole date of 2057 definitely could have been an incentive to try to behave in prison, especially when you're around all this violence, um, you're seeing people stabbed. I even think you mentioned to me that when you was in high desert, you saw a white dude killed. So how did you, you know, how did you uh, manage to do time in prison? feeling that you was never going to get out. Sometimes we feel that, like you said, we're so angry that we want to be violent to release some of this frustration. So um, what, what is that? You know, what's that like? Well, you know, that that is true. At, at certain circumstances, you like, man, you know what, man, if a person said the wrong thing to me, I'm going to hurt them. But then over time, after, you know, sitting in the cells because you're always on lockdown, you get to read and you get to expand your mind and you get to uh, gain the self-control. So then you begin to learn how to build a program within prison to help you sustain through the time. And so you have mentioned you mentioned to me that in the course of your incarceration, you started to take self-help, self-help classes, and you have accumulated many, many certificates for completing these self-help classes. Um, what are some of the classes you feel that played a pivotal role in you changing? Well, I'm gonna be honest, which I think the most important, important program I took was with a uh, my college. When I went to college to get my AA degree in psychology, when I started taking the psychology classes and I started learning about behavior and uh, things of that nature and really educating myself and sitting down and taking it serious, I think that's when when everything changed because it teaches you how to critically think and look at life different, how to actually use your, use your mind. Most definitely. You know, I think the most important thing about some of those classes is like you say, you know, when we out there living in the street, we have already given ourselves a, a solution when certain problems occur, you know, so we'll tell ourselves, okay, if I go down here and somebody hit me or somebody disrespect me, <clears throat> I'm going to pull my gun out. I'm going to do A, B, and C. So now the change is basically now that if somebody does this or does that, now I have a, a different positive solution to the problem and that's basically all that is is just reprogramming our mind to act different to to uh to do things different and even to not go into certain areas to try to eliminate problems you know instead of going to the park taking the gun with me because people would be at the park tripping now i just don't go to the park so did you find yourself exactly experiencing some stuff like that exactly no that's exactly you hit it right on the nail to teach you how to eliminate obstacles that's in your way 
It teaches you how to put your pride to the side, your ego to the side. You know, how to how to look at something that you'll usually trip over and be like, you know what? That's not even worth it. You know that that you know what? It's a bigger picture. I'm gonna go ahead and let that go. Right. Because you know, I think we realize at the end of the day, you know, because we all human and, and sometimes, you know, some of these gang beliefs get deeply embedded in ourselves, right? And so my thing ha has realized that at the end of the day, the person I inconvenience the most is myself. You know, sometimes, of course, I'm going to still have violent thoughts. You know, it's, it's a it's a tricky world out here. And people seem to be people seem to be in the business of being disrespect, being disrespectful, but not necessarily wanting what comes with that disrespect. So now at the end of the day, it's all about keeping myself free. And so I'm able to participate in the lives of people that mean the most to me, man. And so that's that's just what it's about. You know, it's about positive change and realizing we really just hurt ourselves, you know. Um, let me ask you, uh, are you still in contact with, with, with uh, you know, your family, your mother and stuff like that? Yes, I have a wire uh, support system. I'm still in contact with my, my mother, my father. I talk to my father all the time, uh, my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, my friends. Uh, I got a wire support system. So, you know, everybody's still pushing. They still keeping their head up. And uh, I think most of all, you know, they, they at this point in my life, they proud of, you know, I, I published my book, uh, Little State of Transition. That's on Amazon. But I, I do deep reflection in there. You know, I, I talk about the things that, uh, you know, how my mother used to abuse me and, and beat me and and things of that nature so i've done a deep introspection and she's read the book and we actually talked about it so we cleared a lot of things that you know that, that was conflicted between us right and so you know um i think that's that's fortunate for you to be able to have such a such a large positive support system because a lot of people don't realize how extremely important that is you know many of us when we go to prison our friends you know uh, our family or whoever, a lot of that support falls by the wayside. And then along with the disappointment of that, we're dealing with the with the daily, you know, BS that happens in prison. And sometimes we fall into a deep space and, you know, violence is an outlet to try to get out of that. Or at least that's what we believe. But we really just inconvenience ourselves even more, you know, going to the hole, catching shoe terms, losing property, so on and so forth, man. So. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm extremely proud of just your your educational elevation, man, and the way you articulate yourself, the accountability that you take and the obvious maturity that you have gained since going to prison. So you also share with me that right now you are um, you are having some positive news in, in trying to get back, trying to get your sentence changed a little bit or, or something of that nature. Can you expound a little bit on, on that? Oh, yeah, right now I'm uh, going through a resentencing phase. It's called the People vs. Heard 1170D. Uh, for juveniles, they got the functional equivalent to life without parole. So uh, if they grant my resentencing, then they'll vacate my sentence and I'll be sent back down to the juvenile court because uh, you may not know, but uh, it was around about 2018 when Proposition 57 passed and Senate Bill 1391 passed. But now in the state of California, if you were 14 or if you 14 or 15 years old, you can no longer be tried as an adult. So if my people versus her 1170D resentence get granted, it will trigger that and they'll, it'll send me back to juvenile court, which I'll be released. Well, I most definitely hope that happens for you. And you said something earlier in the interview that I thought was profound. You said that I was tried, but not by a jury of my peers. Elaborate on that a little bit. What did what did you mean by that when you said that? Yes, when I say uh, not a jury of my peers, I mean that people that's not my color. I was tried by you know uh, uh, white people, basically. You know, people that don't understand the environment that I come from, the, uh, the things that we go through. You know, the people that may look at things a different way, or people that may just convict you just based on how you look and what they think about you. So when I say a jury of my peers, I mean people that that that's not of my background, that's not of my family's background, that's not of your family's background. That's quick to judge us. Quick to judge us by, you know, like they say, quick to judge a book by its cover. No, that's 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 extremely important, right? And and that reminds me when I was when I was going through um when I was going through my trial doing jury selection, there was a white guy up there and he said he he had a brother, many family and friends who were 
involved in law enforcement. And he said, you know, if the police have this guy sitting here, he's obviously guilty because the police don't make mistakes like that, you know. And so, um, of course, um, my lawyer was able to have him removed from the that jury. But my thing, too, is how many people think like that and just don't express those thoughts, you know. And, and so, like you said, it's uh, it's important, but it's very rare that we do have a jury of our peers because when you have individuals who have not experienced things like this or they have not experienced family members going through things like this like you said they do have a tendency to prejudge and come to come to an arrived decision without clearly even hearing the evidence you know so um that's that's very important and a lot of times you know for people in our in our, in our situation caught up in these gangs we think things is going to be different you know we may we may watch TV and think that when we get arrested, we are going to have a fair trial. And, and it's nothing like TV. That's all. That's all I want to say. And so hopefully if you're hearing this, the best thing to do is to, to try to avoid that lifestyle. So you will not get caught up and have to experience things like myself and, and the brother Big Stay here, man. Um, I so a, Go ahead. No, that's a good thing. You say that right about people not getting caught up in the lifestyle, right? Because it's. Right now, I'm at that crossroads in my life to where I'm elevating my mind frame, right? And what I want to do when I come home is I want to stop the gang violence within the community, man, so that the babies can grow up and, and have a better future, that our people could become one because, you know, we're stronger together. You know, like they say, man, divided you fall, you know, and you're stronger to stand together. So I want to bring the community together, man, so the babies could be grow up together, man, and uh, the babies can have a better future, man, and we can teach our, our, our kids to be more than what they think they can be because I really believe, man, if you put your mind to it, you really can do it. Even when you look back at history, like, you know, brothers like Huey P. Newton or brothers like Malcolm X or uh, 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 people like Nelson Mandela, man, that, that that made a bad situation and became great. Like, we we have to show our future generations, man, that it's more to life to, to than what they see because, you know, while we doing these rap songs and glorifying things to these rap songs, man, this is the things that they taking into their mind, and you got to be careful what you plan to tell a person's mind, because you know, them seeds will eventually sprout. So now I'm taking it upon myself, man, to try to try to bring peace to the community. Most definitely, and that is, you know, that's extremely uh, commendable of you. And like I say, man, once again, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, even though this is the first time that we met, I'm proud of you, and the elevation that you have took because 32 years old is still extremely young and you know when i was in prison you still had some you had, you had many 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 people who was around 32 years old who still had a deeply gang banging belief system you know and so um to be around all this negativity you know and to be able to pull yourself away from the norm and take a path of education and accountability i definitely definitely believe is extremely commendable, man. So um, I'm going to sincerely pray for you. You know, I hope that you will eventually, and I'm sure you will eventually, you know, uh, obtain your freedom. And so is there is there anything else that you would like to say to, uh, before we close out the interview in terms of just having people look at any any type of, uh, you know, any type of, 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 of content that you got out there? You know, you mentioned you had some books and, and anything that you would just like, you know, people to know about. Yeah, you can check out uh, my documentaries, Little State of Struggle, Young Black Men in America. My second documentary, Little State, Beautiful Elevation. Uh, I got the book on Amazon, Little State of Transition, and also the uh, music videos that Brother Mission. But most of all, what I like to say is, man, love, just think about your actions because if we killing each other, the system killing us, Soon we're gonna be extinct. So it's like at the end of the day, we all we got as a people. So we gotta, you know, we gotta start loving ourselves and caring about ourselves, man. That's 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 what I mostly want to say, man. And I want to give a shout out, man, to my boy uh Chill, man, for having me on 16 to life. Uh give a shout out to my boy Big Shot, my boy Big TC, Slime Lake and Rock Me to a lie. Uh my boy Soldier Lick, you know, and uh, all the other soldiers that's behind the walls, man. Keep your head up, stay strong, man, and uh don't let a bad situation or a bad circumstance, man, determine your future, man. Notice, man, you can use this cell as an office. You know, you you got to look at it, man. You an employee in a billion dollar business. So, man, just stay strong and uh, thank you, chill. I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you, man. And there you go kicking some game, man. The brother said you have to use the cell 
as an office, man, that's profound. You know, that's he's pretty much telling me that even though he may be in a in a predicament right now that's undesirable, he is still taking that and he's making the best of it. Because like I said earlier, you know, you have some dudes who get caught up in the madness that that, you know, that uh, that goes on in prison. And uh, and unfortunately, they just create a bigger hole from themselves, man. And also, we got to give a shout out to my boy, Mr. Shalita. GP the beast for putting me in contact with you, man. And so, you know, that's what uh, us brothers we got to do. We got to politic with each other, man. And we got to make our situation uh, work for us instead of running to these, you know, these these publications who have not experienced the things we're experiencing. You know, giving all our 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 content to Vlad and 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 all these other, you know, Adam Twenty Two and all these dudes who are really just exploiting our culture, man. So. Exactly. Shout out Big GP. Hey, thank you once again, man. And like I said, I've been through a lot of what you're going through. And so my sincere hopes and prayers for you, first and foremost, is stay safe, you know, because I know up in there, first and foremost, safety is safety is paramount. You know, unfortunately, you're in a situation where anything can happen. It's unpredictable being in prison. I already know without a shadow of a doubt, when you hit the streets, you're going to do good things, man. And uh, believe me, homie, it's it's, it's uh. It's beautiful out here. And so everything that you're doing is worth it, man. Stay your own, man. Um, try to be swayed as less as possible by what's going on around you. You know, I know sometimes things happen up in there, but stay on the good path, homie. You eventually most most definitely, without a question, will be home, man. And uh, I already know you're going to do good things. Yes, sir. Thank you. All praise be to Allah. Most definitely, man. You already know what time it is, man. It's your boy, 16 to life. Hey, resume normal program, man. I'm going like a turkey through the cone. All right, homie, I appreciate you.